Thanks everyone for joining me for the Greeks part two today, where I'll be walking through Delta and Gamma. My name is Edward Madla of the Options Industry Council. Uh, I've been in the options business in one way or another for about 23 years, starting on the trading floors in Chicago and New York as an options professional market maker. Uh, that lasted for a very good, strong five years or so until uh, the, the market and the, the business changed dramatically. Um, I started to weave my way out of that business when uh, we went to uh, decimals and we went to multiple listings. For those of you who are, are older like myself, you might recall that uh, if you wanted to trade options on a particular stock back in, in the day, you had to go to one exchange. They weren't listed across the board. And if you were going to get a market on an option worth, say, $3, your market was at best going to be two and seven eighths at three and an eighth. And that's how I got in the business. A very good time to be a market maker trading for edge. Uh, but then when the, uh, when the industry went to uh, multiple listings across all the exchanges, competition greatly increased. And then also really simultaneously, we went to decimalization. Uh, so that greatly tightened the bid-ask spreads. I made my way out of the professional market making industry, traded independently, more directional, and uh, uh, not, not trading for edge anymore, but trading for uh, with, with bias and with market uh, opinion. Did that for a good solid 10 years. And I still do that, just not professionally anymore. Uh, I was a futures broker for some time, but now for the past five and a half years working with OIC as an educator, this is all I do is teach classes to investors about options uh, ranging from beginner to advanced level concepts. I consider what we're going to go through today somewhere in between. I don't think the Greeks are too complicated. It is just terminology on simple concepts and that's what we'll go through uh, today. First, our disclaimer, options are fairly complex and need to be understood before using them in a live account. In the outline, a few comments on Greeks from a general broad perspective, and then we'll get into Delta followed by Gamma. Uh, I would say Delta is probably the most well-known Greek and most uh, well understood. And on the other end of the spectrum is Gamma, the least understood and the least known. Uh, so I'll define each of these and walk through the characteristics and uh, what'll make today's presentation a little bit different and interesting is the knowledge checks and the examples where I'll try to apply delta and gamma to positions and put numbers on some of the examples, asking questions to get your get your mind thinking and, and go through exercises uh, for both delta and gamma, uh, walking through what are the Greek exposures and how do they change over time. Uh, so that's what the agenda is looking like for today. First, you have the, the five Greeks, and this is first order Greeks. Uh, there's many more where this came from, second order and third order Greeks that get very detailed, but these are the five that you are generally going to experience when uh, learning and applying the Greeks. You can find these all on, on your platform rather easily. I'll talk about Delta and Gamma today, uh, but as I said, there, there's nothing too complex here. Theta, expected option value change as time passes, Vega, option value change as volatility changes and row option value change as risk-free rate changes. All of these attempt to isolate a variable within the options pricing model and then calculate an expected change in the option as that variable changes. Uh, gamma is the only one that is indirect and it's, it's tied to delta. And you'll see that uh, as we walk through the presentation today. I want to start with a few characteristics about the Greeks in general. First of all, they only matter during the options lifetime, meaning when they reach expiration, when an option reaches expiration date, they're only worth their intrinsic value. So the impact of any Greek is on the options extrinsic value or time value. The intrinsic value of the option is sensitive to stock price movements in the money options have intrinsic value. That value changes as the stock moves. All of these Greeks are an attempt to forecast an expectation of the effect on an options value as one of the other variables changes. That's volatility, time, interest rates. Uh, and, and of course, stock price movements. The magnitude of these Greeks, how much do they matter? 
differs for each option contract. And I will point out with respect to Delta and Gamma today, in the money versus at the money and out of the money, where are they greatest and where are they the least? And then also near term versus far term, looking at expiration dates. Uh, they're gonna be different in, in the way uh, the Greeks uh, are out outlined and the way they behave. Uh, also, I have to say, they're theoretical in nature, meaning they don't actually uh, come to fruition the way they are identified on your screen. Uh, the delta that you're seeing is an attempt to predict or estimate a future value. Uh, the, the theta you see is, is estimating a future value based on changes in variables, but they are theoretical. And in practice, you would expect to witness some variance between what Greeks are suggesting and what actually happens. And that is because uh, the Greeks will isolate themselves and assume all other factors remain unchanged, which is not going to be the case. Uh, as, as time passes, as stock prices move, each of the Greeks changes. And that's what we will uh, we'll repeat that concept over and over again as we walk through, starting with Delta. Consider Delta as the first Greek we'll get to today. Uh, it is a comparison of the changes in the stock price versus the changes in the options value. And it assumes that the other variables, uh, variables will remain constant. Volatility, time, uh, interest rates remain constant. Let's dig deeper into Delta uh, with a few different uh, definitions, looking at it from a few different angles. And then we'll get into the, the knowledge check question and answer sessions, which I think uh, will really drive home some of these points. Uh, delta is the option values sensitivity to stock price or the expected change in an options price every time the stock moves one full point. Now, deep in the money options have high deltas approaching 100. This makes sense. If the call option is deep in the money, then for each one point move in the stock, the options value is going to roughly change by just about that full amount or that 100% amount. You'll see deltas expressed in a few different ways, but one, 1.0, uh, could otherwise be expressed as 100% for, um, uh, for each particular move in the stock, the option value is going to change by about 100%, the same exact amount as uh, as the stock price moves. At the money options have deltas that center around 50. The definition of at the money is a bit loose. Uh, you could say that uh, to be very specific about it, it's when the stock price and strike price equal each other. Um, but in practice, there is some range around the current stock price that, uh, that, that options are considered to be at the money. So it's roughly that that 50 delta uh, with strike prices uh, close to where the stock is. So right around, you might hear investors say that 40, 50 delta options are considered sort of roughly that, that at the money range uh, with deltas around 50 and far out of the money options have low deltas approaching zero. Uh, from a conceptual perspective, this means the option value will not change very much, if at all, as the uh, stock price changes. Uh, now, when I learned options really for the first time you know, back uh, with uh, with a whole trading company, you know, the largest options market making firm in the late 90s, um, I, I was taught to think about concepts from a certain perspective. And when you're trying to understand uh, the Greeks or cost of carry, whatever it is, it's it's often easiest to think of an example but then push that example to an extreme circumstance or maybe an unrealistic circumstance. And so I'll, and I'll just do that right here, far out of the money options approaching zero, just to give you an example of what this mindset is like. If you are one minute until expiration and the stock price is at 50 and we're looking at the strike price uh, of 100, the 100 strike calls, when the stock goes from 50 to 51, you would not expect that option value to change at all. That option is going to have basically a zero delta. It won't change at all. On the other end, on the other side of that, with the stock at 50, what about a call option with a strike price of 10? 
It's $40 in the money. As that stock moves a dollar from 50 to 51, I would expect that option to go one for one from 40 to 41. So there's your 100 delta. And then you're at the money options, sort of moving right around with that at about uh, at about half of the speed of the stock price. And I'll get more, I'll get more into that uh, with the examples. Now, what about short term versus long term uh, as we're looking at deltas? Um, short term, as you get closer and closer to expiration, uh, your 50 delta at the money options really don't change. 50 delta remains 50 delta, whether it's nine months, six months, three months, or one day, your at the money options hold that 50 delta level. But your out of the money and in the monies behave differently. As you approach expiration, in the money options naturally gravitate towards 100 deltas, and out of the money options gravitate down towards zero. And you will often notice that as you're tracking an option. Again, all else equal uh, as the expiration date approaches. In the money options will gravitate towards 100. Out of the monies gravitate down towards zero. And you're at the money stay right there around 50. Let's look at calls and puts uh, and, and, and also identify what you have with the four outright positions. We know we have the ability to either buy or sell calls buy or sell put. So let's look at that here. Calls have positive or long deltas, which really means that the relationship between stock price movement and what's going to happen to your option is, is positive correlation. Stock price goes up, call price goes up. Stock down, call down. And when you buy a call, you are purchasing positive deltas. You're getting long delta. If you're long delta, you want the stock to go up and this price to work in your favor. The stock moves down, it's working against you. Positive correlation. If you sell a call, you're selling someone else the positive deltas. So a short call position is short delta. And if the stock moves down, that's good for you. You profit. Your short delta, you want moves down and you want the price to go down of what you sold. A stock price moving higher is going to work against you. That's short delta if you sell a call. Put options, just flip the analysis around. Put options themselves have negative deltas. When you buy a put option, you are purchasing negative deltas. In more simple terms, you want the stock price to go down. You're short deltas. You're buying short deltas. If the stock price goes down, the price goes up on your option. That's what you want. You are short delta. You want to capitalize on the stock price moving down. The stock goes up then your put has this negative or opposite correlation. And in the case of owning puts, stock price going up works against you. And then the final outright position, the fourth one, selling a put. If you sell someone else negative deltas, then you yourself are taking on a long delta position. Selling puts is a long delta position. If the stock price goes up, the put price goes down. And for the seller, that's good. That's what, what it means to be long delta and stock price going down, uh, the put price goes against you. And when you're long delta, stock price goes down. That's not what you want. So there's your four outright positions. We're going to get a little further into that when we get into the examples. But I do want to outline one other uh, somewhat you know, largely ex uh, accepted definition of what delta is is uh, another way investors might use delta. And that's what I'm going to stress here. Use delta uh, is the probability of an option of finishing in the money. A, a 70 delta call, for example, could indicate a 70% chance of an option of finishing in the money. Uh, selling a 30 delta call could indicate a 70% chance of it finishing out of the money. You know, I did learn this definition from the professional firms that I worked for. Uh, however, this definition is not completely mathematically correct. It is an understood and accepted general definition of delta. And I bring it up because some investors may want to use this to help guide them when selecting a strike price for their trade. Uh, now, remember, the, the percent likelihoods that the market is telling you may differ and often will differ from your opinion. 
Uh, so you have to take that into consideration. But as a starting point, you can look to see what kind of delta am I looking at in these options? And what does that tell me uh, from the market's perspective about the likelihood of this option uh, finishing in the money? It certainly does not equal, you know, moneyness status in the money, out of the money does not equal profitability. And of course, profitability is determined from uh, your purchase price and your sale price. And that's it. And so there, you know, there's some definitions. It's going to get a lot more interesting now that we, when we apply it. And this is the, the exercise I want to go through for the next couple of slides, talking about delta shares trading 100. We got 45 days to go until expiration, and we'll, we'll start with this question. Investor buys the 110 calls for a dollar. What is the expected option value of shares go up to 105? Bought the 110 calls, paid a dollar. Delta here is 20 cents. Delta is saying for each $1 move higher, the option is going to move by 20 cents. It moved, uh, the stock moved $5. So from $1 up $5, there's two. So uh, 20 cents for each dollar move times five is $1 add to here. And of course, that will not, that will certainly not be the actual case. Because even as the stock goes from 100 to 101 to 102 to 103, this delta is going to change. Not to mention volatility is going to be changing and it may take some time for that move to occur. So days of expiration will be changing. So this again is estimated. It's a snapshot to give you some idea. If you wanted to do a deeper analysis of what you would expect this option to be worth based on this move, maybe you would get out the calculator and change the days from 45 down to 40 or 35 and change volatility a little bit. Maybe volatility comes down slightly if you have that kind of a move higher. Change that number as well and, and change the stock price to 105 and then calculate uh, what an expected value will be. But here's, here's the quick snapshot that you can get from your options chain, looking at delta, looking at the strike and making that, that calculation. Uh, here's another example. If an investor sells two of the 90 strike puts, what is the estimated probability that the contracts finish out of the money? And here's is that example. Maybe you use this as a starting point to decide what strike you want to sell. The 90 strike puts have a 15 delta. So the market is suggesting an 85% chance that this option finishes out of the money. You might feel totally differently. This stock's at 100 and maybe you think, it is now testing a support level for the third time and it's going to break it and get crushed. And you might think the, the likelihood of finishing out of the money is different or maybe less than 85%. Uh, but it, it, it's something investors still can use. What is the delta? What's the likelihood of success on this trade? And then compare that to the premium you receive. And you could use that to develop some, torpus, some type of strategy and I'm not going to get specific on what you can do there. Investors can, can choose for themselves, but based on their likelihood of success, what type of premium are they looking for and how confident are you in that trade? And that can be some way to develop a strategy that you can implement over and over again as you make trading decisions. And then the last example here, uh, if an investor buys the 100, 110 call spread for 320, What's the expected value of the spread if the shares increase $5? Let's look at this in pieces. The 100 call is what we bought. So we're long 50 deltas and we sold the 110s. That's short 20. That's net long 30 deltas on the spread. If the stock moves up by $5 and we assume everything stays the same, each dollar we would expect uh, this 320 to move up by 30 cents or a dollar 50 total uh, up to 470. And, and the takeaway here is, is just the fact that when you have a, a position consisting of a number of options and you want to calculate your delta, you simply can just add them up. And um, that is how you would handle uh, spreads. You know, spreads in general are ways to mitigate risk. Stating the obvious, when you when you do vertical spreads, debits or credits, you are buying or selling a cheaper option to mitigate some form of risk. Maybe it's the premium at risk or the volatility exposure or your theta exposure. You're mitigating that risk or mitigating the Greek exposures. I'm going to stick with Delta as I walk through an actual trade. 
uh, selecting the iron condor as my example on purpose, and I'm going to stick with iron condor. I'm going to bring this exact same example back up when I get towards the end of gamma, so we can compare and and relate delta and gamma to each other. So here we have the iron condor, and just to, to reflect on what that is, iron condor is selling two vertical spreads, selling a put spread, selling a call spread. So uh, you've executed the iron condor trade selling the 80 90 put spread and selling the 110 120 call spread that's selling the 90 put buying the 80 put and then selling the 110 call buying the 120 what is the delta of the call spread selling the 110s buying the 120s that is short 20 deltas and long five so that is net short 15. what's the delta of the put spread selling the 90 puts delta of 20 remember selling puts puts have negative delta we sold the put option so this trade selling the 90 puts is a long 20 delta trade we bought the 80 puts buying the negative deltas of five so put those together and your long 15 for the entire position of the iron condor that means the delta is zero net zero and that makes sense. That's what we want with the iron condor. We're selling two spreads. We don't want the stock to move. We don't want that directional move to hurt us. We want at the initial construction of the position to have a uh, neutral delta with respect to directional market exposure. And that's what we have. The, the classic construction of the iron condor is going to look like this or similar to this, where your long deltas on one, sh on one side cancel out the short deltas on the other, and you have a net effect right around zero. Again, keep this all in mind, because I'm bringing this back up when we get to, to gamma. But before I get there, let's move the stock around, because it's going to move. 30 days later, the stock has risen and is beginning to test the short call spread. Stock's up to 108, and about a month has passed. What's the delta of the spread now? We're short the 110s, long the 120s. That is short 35. What's the delta of the put spread? Well, here's nothing on the put spread side, so zero. Add all of that together, and now short 35 deltas. That means as the stock continues to move higher, we're going to lose. We're giving back. The value of what we sold is increasing. Short delta. If the value of the stock drops from this point, from 108 down, or short delta, that's going to work in our favor. So now we have directional risk. Short delta means risk to the upside. And what can you do with respect to specifically the iron condor trade? A number of different things here. Stock's up at 108. Uh, you could close the put spread, although you know maybe this 80 put isn't even worth selling. Uh, check out what the 90 puts trading at. Maybe you just buy it back for a nominal amount and, and hold the 80s in case the stock crashes within the next two weeks. You've got a free 80 put, not worth selling. If it doesn't have any value to it, you can uh, you can close out the put spread and roll the whole thing up to a higher strike if you want. You can close the call spread out and roll that up to a higher strike, or maybe just close the call spread and be done with the trade. Uh, all sorts of different things you can do with the iron condor because of the, the multitude of positions here. Uh, but back, you know, off the iron condor and more to general context versus delta uh, as it relates to buyers versus sellers, you could say buyers of options are looking for movement. Sellers of options want no movement. Or to put the Greek terms on it, buyers of options want delta to work in their favor while sellers want time decay or theta to work in their favor. And that's the difference between uh, buyers and sellers, which will come up again as I walk through now. I'm gonna take that example as I get through gamma and, and relate these two to each other uh, because gamma is delta's sensitivity to stock price. As the stock moves, I know delta is not going to stay the same. It is going to move. How much is it going to move? The stock changes by a dollar. 
what is the delta going to be? What's the new delta going to be as the stock moves by a dollar? That is what gamma is trying to predict. Again, all other pricing factors constant in decimal form. It is the adjustment or the acceleration of delta. Now, gamma is greatest for at the money and short-term options. Push it to an extreme. If you have a deep out of the money option, zero delta, and the stock moves $1, you would not expect that delta to change at all. So out of the money options, same thing for in the money. If it's 100 delta, you wouldn't expect that to change either with a $1 move. Out of the money, in the money options, small gamma. But at the money, different story. Your at the money options are going to move from 50 to 60 to 70, back down to 50 and 40 as that stock moves up and down around your strike price. So at the money options have higher gamma. Also, short term, if there's only one day left till expiration and your at the money option goes to in the money, it's going to move from 50 to 100 pretty quick. And then what if it sells off back below your strike? Now you're going to move from 100 down to zero pretty quick. You're going to have very fast acceleration of gamma of, of delta moves or acceleration of gamma close to expiration versus your longer term options. If you've got 18 months till expiration, an at the money option delta of 50, the stock moves $1, it's going to have a very muted effect on the delta. At the money, short term is where gamma is the greatest. Now, this just outlines really what I just said, but it puts it into more of graphical form. And I wanted to, to repeat this because it helps the concepts sink in. Here you have, uh, we're looking at the 60 strike call option. What is the gamma versus the stock price? At 60, you're at the money level, gamma is the greatest. As the stock price moves up or down, gamma decreases until it reaches a point where the, stop, the, the deltas just don't change. It's either far enough in the money or out of the money where the deltas just stick towards 100 or zero. Another way to really look at that is what is your delta as the stock moves? At 60, or right here at that 50 delta level. As the stock goes up and our option is in the money, the delta approaches 100. And as the stock drops, the delta approaches zero. As we get closer to expiration, if this 14 becomes 7 or 5 or 1, then you'll still have 60 strike, 50 delta. But as the stock moves up, this line is going to approach 100. And on the downside, it'll approach 0 a lot faster. And some of you may be familiar with the term exploding gamma on expiration week and on expiration day, where at the money options witness extraordinary changes in their deltas. And for professional firms that have large positions, maybe at multiple strikes around where the stock is trading, if you get a lot of volatility on expiration day or expiration week, the deltas are changing, and that firm or that uh, investor is experiencing exploding gamma as the option deltas change. Uh, between 0 and 100. Here's a snapshot look, gamma versus time. Gamma of at the money calls increases as you reach expiration. So I said before, near term options, you have this compare the one month versus the 18 month. Near term options have a much greater gamma at the money. Now as you go out of the money, you have this sharp drop off but the longer term, you get this linear line here. You can think about it as your deltas and your gammas for long-term options. That's sort of, for at the money strikes, they fan out. There's more of a range of 50, 40, and 60 delta options, and they just don't change as fast. Uh, close to expiration, at the monies are changing very rapidly, and you're deep in the monies, and you're deep out of the monies on these, on these ends here are changing very slowly, if at all, whereas the longer term options are a bit different. Uh, key characteristics of gamma. And a lot of what I just said will come through clearer uh, when I go through the example, similar to what I did for 
uh, for Delta. But I do want to talk scalping gamma a bit because this is something that, that professional traders and professional firms often do. And it, it's a question I get. So what is scalping gamma? Well, first, it really is something that professional traders uh, are, are more inclined to do who are watching the market every day, all throughout the day. And it starts with the premise that the trader or the firm uh, wants to have a delta neutral position at all times. So when they execute an options position, they are then trading stock in order to offset their deltas. And as the stock price changes and the deltas change of the options piece, the firm or the trader is then rehedging or re-establishing their delta neutral requirement. And scalping gamma is something that can be done if you're long options. And I'll, I'll just walk through you know, verbally what I think the simplest example could be uh, to outline what this is all about. Let's say you buy 10 at the money call options. That's your options trade. And it's not going to change. We're not going to do anything further with the options than that. We buy 10 at the money calls. There are 50 delta calls. We bought 10 of them. So we have 500 deltas in the calls. And now remember, buying calls is long delta. So long 500 deltas. We want delta neutral. So immediately, right after buying those 10 calls, we sell 500 shares of stock. That neutralizes delta. If the stock goes up, the delta of the calls increases. Let's say it goes to 100. If the delta of the calls goes to 100, now all of a sudden we're long 1,000 deltas on the calls. We're only short 500 shares. We want to be delta neutral, so we'd have to sell an additional 500 shares of stock at the new higher level to become delta neutral. Last step, final step, the stock crashes and comes all the way down. And, and you know we're long calls, so the stock goes below the strike price. And the delta of the calls goes down to zero. So we're long 10 calls, but there's no delta to them. We're short 1,000 deltas with the stock position. We want to be delta neutral. We buy 1,000 shares back. Now think about what we did. We bought calls and did nothing with them, but we sold 500 shares of stock at a certain price, sold 500 more at a higher price, and then bought all 1,000 shares back lower than both of the sales. That's scalping gamma. That's what you can do with long options if you're trading delta neutral and the stock is moving. That's what scalping gamma is. Now this, you know, this is an art form because all the while that's happening, time decay is working against you. Now back you know, to that simple example, if the stock continued to rally, the position that I have is gonna make more and more money. The longer I can hold off on selling shares, the more I can capitalize on that movement in the stock price. But if I am too greedy and I wait too long and I don't sell those additional 500 shares before the stock hits a, a, a resistance level and then uh, gets hit for um, a, a correction, I've missed my opportunity to scalp gamma the way the long option gives me the opportunity to. And this is something that you know I, I've seen traders that were uh, fantastic at their market timing and their ability to do this. And I've seen other traders who were not so great. At, at their timing on when to scalp and when it's really it comes down to when to rehedge the position and and uh, to take advantage of that long gamma position and to scalp shares appropriately um, but not to be overly greedy to the point where you miss your opportunities it's really it can be a stressful thing to to scalp long gamma positions but i can tell you what's more stressful than that is hedging delta neutral a short gamma position? Short gamma is selling options. If you sell options, then you want no movement at all. And as your stock price is changing, uh, if you're gonna continually re-hedge your position, it's just the opposite of the, the example I gave. The person who, who sold those call options, delta neutral, is going to be buying shares to re-hedge at higher levels, then they're selling them and they would effectively be scalping gamma for losses every single time they traded stock. Now, sometimes you have to do that. If stock keeps running, you're gonna lose more and more money. So you have to pick up those shares and, um, 
and, and rehedge at some point. But again, how far can you let that go? How greedy can you be? How much risk can you take? It's a stressful ordeal. Uh, but if you followed that, you know, that, that's, that's pretty good insight into how Gamma works and how some firms try to take advantage of it, especially when they perceive a particular industry or underlying uh, to be more volatile in the future than it is today. They can just pick up some options, trade delta neutral, and try to scalp their position, scalp gamma for profits that more than offset their loss in time decay as they hold a long options position. Let's do a knowledge check on, on gamma. Uh, and I'm going to get to the same iron condor trade, but first let's just isolate gamma for our example. Shares trading 50, 10 days until expiration. Uh, if the investor bought the 50 calls and shares increased by a dollar, what's the new delta? Now the 50 calls here are uh, at a 51 delta. And if the stock goes up by a dollar, what's my new delta? Gamma is suggesting that the new delta is going to move by 12 cents or 12 points. That's 63. The new delta would be 63 call delta going up as the, uh, as the stock moves up. If an investor was short the 50 calls, stock trading 50, would a share price increase to 52 result in an increase or decrease in the gamma position? Here we're starting out with a precisely at the money option, 50 calls, stock at 50. The stock starts to move away from at the money. Remember, at the money is where gamma is the greatest. So as the stock moves either way, the gamma itself is going to decrease. And you can see that right here with stock at 50, your gamma is greatest and it drops off in either direction. Uh, now this one's a little more involved. If a trader's long 10 of the 52 calls and they are delta neutral from the outset and shares increase from 50 to 51, how many shares would they need to buy or sell in order to remain delta neutral? So I'll walk through this one again. The trader's long 10 of the 52 calls. Here's the 52 calls. The trader's long 10 of them. That's 29 deltas for each one option times 10, 290 deltas. If they are delta neutral, that means they're long 10 calls and short 290 shares. Shares go up by a dollar. The new options Delta is 39 or 390 deltas on your option. You're only short 290 shares. So if you want to get delta neutral, sell another 100 shares, and now you have 390 total short shares, and you're back to delta neutral. Uh, now here's the, further that, that scalping gamma idea. You know, this is working out in your favor. The stock's moving up and that's good and your long deltas are starting to pay off for you. Uh, but if you didn't hedge here at 51 and you waited to 52 and the stock got to 52, that would be better because you didn't sell anything at 51. You waited till 52 and now you can sell your 200 shares uh, at 52 instead of doing anything at 51. And so maybe, maybe then you can see it, it's not, it's not so easy to do this scalping gamma thing because when the stock moves, you have that temptation to say, well, I want to squeeze this out for as much as I can get. If I keep uh, neutralizing my deltas very quickly, I'm not going to be able to extract enough out of this to overcome time decay. So you want to get as much as you can without missing your opportunity. Easier said than done and, and certainly becomes an art form uh, for the professionals that are good at it. Now, as I promised, back to the iron condor, and we're gonna tie delta and gamma together with the expectation of a neutral market. We did this iron condor trade just as we did, we did before, uh, selling the put spread and selling the call spread. Now, just long or short, what is the gamma of the short call spread? Not looking at numbers here, just long or short. Short the 110 calls, long the 120s, Gamma is greater for your closer to at the money options. If we sell an option, doesn't matter if it's call or put, we are short gamma. So we sold the call option here that has the higher gamma number, meaning we're short gamma through the call spread. 
Put spread is the same answer. We're selling the 90s. The 90 put has greater gamma than the 80 put. Selling options is short in gamma. So the gamma of the put spread is also short. Add them together and we have what you might consider to be an elevated level of exposure to market movements because we have two short gamma positions. What does that mean? That means as the stock moves in either direction, our deltas are going to be changing. And that's not what we want when we do an iron condor trade. Again, this is logical. This is what we would expect. We're short gamma, meaning that movement is working against us. You already knew that if you just understood the iron condor trade. Now you're putting the Greeks and the terminology onto it. 30 days later, the stock's risen back to that 108 level. We already said this, back to 108, testing the call spread. So now what is the effect of this? Has the delta of the short put spread become more positive or more negative? And the answer is negative. So the stock rallied and it went the opposite direction. The deltas went the wrong way. What about the call spread? Positive or negative? Again, your short gamma, it's gonna be the opposite effect, the positive move, negative. So here we have, um, and again, another way to look at that, we sold this put spread, which is a long delta spread, sold the 90s, bought the 80s, it's long delta. Now it's zero, so we went from a long delta position to the zero, so it moved opposite, it got more negative. Or on the call spread side of things, remember this was 20 and this was five, so we were short 15, now we're short 35, so it got more negative. And, and that's the effect of being short gamma, short options, and having the stock move work against you when you have a short gamma position. Long gamma is the opposite. You're long options and you want movement. Uh, and then just you know a, a, a characteristic or something to remember is this correlation. Long gamma, again, synonymous with long options. Whether they're calls or puts, doesn't matter. Long gamma is long options and you have this correlation of stock movements to deltas, short gamma is short options. And you have this, this opposite or um, our negative correlation between stock and delta movements. Now one, one comment about the Greeks and about gamma, uh, sometimes I get asked, what's the most important Greek? You know, what, what, what's, what's out there and, and what do you think? Well, most investors say they look at deltas and they track deltas uh, with the, trading background from a professional trading firm's perspective, you know, I, I would say, well, all the Greeks are important. It's hard for me to say this is the most important Greek, but if you were to, to say, I'm only gonna show you one, only one Greek is what you're gonna get, I would choose gamma because there's more information in gamma than any of the other Greeks would tell you. Uh, I've said that long gamma is synonymous with long options. It doesn't necessarily have to be that case. You could have anomalies, but long gamma tells me I'm long options. So if I'm long gamma, that, that also likely tells me I have um, long vega exposure. Decrease in volatility will hurt the position and an increase will help it. It also means I'm suffering from time decay and it tells me which direction my deltas are headed. Doesn't tell me what they are today, but tells me where they're headed. So I know my vega position, I know my theta position, and I know where my deltas are headed if I know what my gamma is. And, and similarly, if I'm short gamma and that's all you tell me, uh, I can deduce that I have exposure to a rise or a hike in implied volatility, that I will be benefiting from, uh, from time decay and I, I know where my deltas are headed. They're headed in the opposite direction of the stock. And my position is looking for, or, or hopefully going to experience less movement than uh, the market is pricing in. So long gamma, short gamma really does tell you a lot and is especially helpful if you have a lot of positions going on and you're, you're looking at a snapshot saying, well, I got all these positions. I got 10 of these, five of those, three of these, 20 of those, you know, put them all together you know, do I have volatility exposure? What's my vega? What's my theta? You can add them up or just knowing long or short gamma gives you that one, one number snapshot of what your position might be. Lots of information in gamma and uh, take some time to sync in. I hope those examples and walking through them helped. We certainly have more information on the Greeks on our website, optionseducation.org. Uh, if you don't know much about OIC, we are provided by OCC, the Options Clearing Corporation. 
as a free and unbiased educational resource for the industry founded back in 1992, uh, podcast videos, and we do our own monthly webinar series. Uh, I will be presenting on July 8th, uh, pricing models, and a little bit more on the Greeks, and then we have one or two webinars every month, so feel free to sign up for those. And if you do want to reach out to our investor services team, uh, you can reach them by email with your questions about what we offer and questions about options. And again, we don't sell anything. So you're not going to be uh, contacted to open an account or sign up for a service. We're not licensed and we don't sell anything. So reach out to the team uh, with any questions that you might have. Uh, hope that was useful. Hope you enjoyed it. Got some time. If there are uh, some questions, uh, then uh, Maria, Teresa, I will be happy to answer a few of those. Sure. Um, there is one question. When you do these spreads for the ones you sold, are you obligated? Uh, for the when you do these spreads, okay, uh, for the options that you sold, are you obligated? So I think this just speaks to the characteristics of being short options. The answer is yes. If you're selling credit spreads or selling uh, condors, uh, then yes, you have those obligations attached to being short the call, short the put, or short both. And you would have to uh, certainly uh, be familiar with what uh, what those obligations are, especially when your option goes in the money. If you're doing credit spreads uh, or vertical spreads and your short option goes in the money, uh, be very careful. I always encourage people, make sure you take some position management um, efforts because you don't want to end up with the stock position that you didn't intend to have. So yes, you do have those obligations when you sell spreads and sell options. The next question, it says, any major changes in the deltas after the option volume increased over the last couple couple of years? So what are the things to keep in mind with um, this highly volatile market in regards to delta? Uh, well, so I, I don't, um, tied together options volume and delta. Um, however, the second part of that question, you know, certainly there is something to say there in higher volatility environments, um, you will see deltas, all deltas across the board will gravitate or be natu naturally pulled towards that 50 level. Uh, as I said through the, through the presentation, You've got, you're at the monies at 50, you're in the monies are, cl are close to 100, and you're out of the monies are close to zero. Well, think about what happens. If volatility explodes, all of a sudden the range of strike price or uh, stock price possibilities increases. And if the range increases and a tremendous amount of volatility is potentially expected in the future, then those 100 delta options all of a sudden might not look like 100 deltas anymore. They may drift down and become 90, 80, 70, 60, 50. And on the other side, your zero deltas will gravitate up. So that's something to watch for and look for as volatility pops. Uh, then you will notice that your, your out of the money and in the money options gravitate in opposite directions, their deltas do anyway, towards that 50 level. And then of course, the opposite would be true if you had a tremendous decrease in volatility, the range of potential stock prices decreases and your 100 deltas uh, you're in the money options gravitate towards 100 and the out of, out of the monies go down towards zero as volatility decreases. So Teresa, there may be a question over there on Discord from Wild Disease. Uh, you want yeah, me to grab I'm it looking, or are you there to grab it? I'm looking okay. now. If you wanted exposure to a stock popping, but options have priced in the IV, how can I use stocks to replace the delta of a single at the money option? Uh, let's see. Um, you want long exposure. The volatility is juiced. You don't want to buy the option because of that. So you're looking to buy stock instead. Uh, I don't know how good of an answer I can give to this one. Um, if you're looking to do stock instead of option, but you want sort of equivalent exposure, um, you're gonna have a tough time doing that 
from a risk profile perspective, we all know options are written on 100 shares. So, uh, you, you, you know, of course, the difference is when you buy shares, you're, you're paying for all of those shares up front. So there really is no way for me to say, well, if you don't want to do the options because volatility is too high, here's the equivalent stock trade. And I wouldn't be able to say that. Uh, you could look at the option delta and decide to buy, you know, that many shares, um, you know, one, a, a 50 delta option, maybe you buy 50 shares. Um, and I think this, this is a question, unfortunately, I don't have a good, uh, a good answer for. Um, if you do have juiced volatility there and you think that the option price is actually too high, uh, then maybe you can look to sell, <clears throat> to sell the option um, that's in the opposite direction. And a, a short put, of course, would be bullish. So maybe you can you can look at at doing something like that um, and taking advantage of, of high premium if that's the case. So uh, maybe not the best answer, but that was the best I could do. I like it. That's what I that's that's the first thing that came to my mind. The sell premium. Any other questions out there, guys? If you have a question, let us know. Going twice? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was a lot to absorb there, that's for sure. I know I did not do that good a job or everyone understood it, but maybe there's just there's just a lot there. And um, especially if this was the first somewhat deep dive for people into Gamma, it may take a few times through those explanations to get that to sink in. Uh, so hopefully that was uh, hopefully that was a good introduction for a lot of people um, and it was useful for you. I will definitely yes. be watching it again, Ed. Go ahead. Good. I, was say, I think uh, Zeus has got a question he's typing right now over in Discord. He had asked if he could ask a question there. Yeah, I'm watching it, Maria. <laughs> Thinking how to word it. And you've got just one throw some more Julio. Out there. Uh, Julio, did I just you? What are the chances that if Ivy dies, it could come back after a brief pullback? Um, well, um, I think I would I would have to say case by case basis. I don't think there would be a rule of thumb on that, other than um, if if there isn't a, a large enough pullback, you certainly would expect implied vol to come back to a significant extent. Um, but I think you know it really would have to look at a circumstance. Why did I vol get crushed in the first place? Have we just you know have we just experienced quiet market environment? Was there a news release? And then what is the extent of that pullback? I think there might be circumstances I could come up with where the answer would be, uh, you know, all of the above. Sometimes it comes back, sometimes it doesn't. Um, and, and a lot of that answer would depend on how significant and the reason for that pullback. If the market gets jittery and there's a big sell-off, I would expect eyeball to pop pretty significantly. I think he's talking about um, in the case of earnings or news release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, same thing, really the same answer. Uh, so after earning, uh, prior to earnings, you would expect IVOL to slightly increase. And I think, you know, in, in, if you watched uh, the Greeks part one, I went through that. And the fact that that doesn't really translate to option prices necessarily going higher, just means they're not decaying. Uh, so you'd expect IVOL to come up there before earnings. After earnings, you expect IVOL to get crushed. Um, however, when does it come back or does it? And it depends, you know, what, what, you know, what's the reason for that? If, if earnings really shocks people and the market is, is getting hammered and in the subsequent days and weeks after earnings, the stock is all over the place because they announced something nobody expected, then maybe it takes a while you know, for that volatility uh, to come back down. It might pop and, and stay that way. Um, or I'm sorry, it might get crushed and then, then, and then maybe stays elevated for a while. So, I think the answer is kind of similar there, case by case. If it gets crushed, what what's the reason for it? Was earnings right in line, dead in line with expectations? Volatility's crushed, the stock's not going anywhere. No, volatility's not coming back anytime soon. Uh, but if something happens to change that, and every earnings announcement's a little bit different, even for a particular stock, and how vol is treated uh, is directly a reflection of, is the market surprised? What kind of movement is there? And how long does it take for that movement to eventually settle down. It could be different every time earnings is announced. 
All right, so just this question, any other Greeks or derivatives he would recommend looking at? I know last week, well, two weeks ago, he mentioned that these five are the most important, but I've been thinking a lot about the relevance of delta gamma versus time and delta versus theta, like how much movement is needed to offset a day of decay, a, a day of theta. Right, yeah, so, th and this is where I, I don't have the defined second order and third order Greeks. I really just referred to them, and to be quite honest, I don't have those in, in my pocket to pull out to say this is what a good second order list of Greeks is to look at. You know, I really don't even have that myself to, to refer to, other than the question is spot on. If you do want to get past these five first order Greeks and look into that second tier where uh, the, the Greeks affect each other, uh, then, then certainly that's where you'd go. Although, but I, I don't have the specific. You know, here are different ones um, for you to to consider with respect to that. And I just not at my fingertips what those second and third tier Greeks are. Um, but I, I had exposure to them. Um, and I think I told the story two weeks ago, or maybe I didn't. That you know, it wasn't that long ago. Someone on our OCC price and margins uh, theoretical value team contacted me. He's like, Ed, I need help. I, these are all third order Greeks. I don't know what they are. Can you help me? And I was like, yes, but give me a couple of days because I've never heard of these before. And so I just, I don't have those off the top of my head, uh, but it's a good question and, and something to look further into for anyone that's interested in getting that deeper analysis on second, third tier Greeks. Okay. That's all I have over here, Maria. And then this is the last question that we are probably going to have time for. Is buying spreads better than playing directionally? Well, um, buying spreads is less aggressive. I always answer these kind of questions the same way. And is, is one better than the other? And the answer is, for me, every circumstance is different. How aggressive do I want to be? If I'm really confident and I'm in a position to be really aggressive, maybe I can just play an outright directional strategy. Um, but often, I'd rather mitigate some of that risk and look to see, you know, if, I, if I'm bullish, uh, maybe a call spread makes more sense because the premiums are a little bit juiced and maybe I'd want to offset some of that risk. And maybe I have an opinion that the stock's going to rally to a certain level, but not beyond that level. And that's where you, that's how you choose short strikes in general. Where might the stock get to, but not go through? That's sort of the, the reach, but not breach idea. And if you have a, an opinion on that, then those are the strike prices that you look to sell. Um, but if you think a big, huge move is coming and, and you're confident and you want to be very aggressive with your trade, you know, I have no opposition to doing outright options. Um, and, and again, it comes down to case by case. Sometimes I do the outright, sometimes do the spreads. It all comes down to risk reward and uh, whether or not you want to mitigate your risks. Okay. Those uh, odds has, okay. Odds last question. What's the difference between, um, out of the money and spread if they have same delta calculated. What's the difference? Can you say that again? It says, what's the difference between OTM and spread if they have the same delta calculated? Um, so if you're, that's a, sorry, I'm not getting that one. I'm not sure. Um, Maybe I'll take a stab at what this might be meaning. So if you have two different, <clears throat> if you have two different strategies, maybe one is an outright, maybe one is a spread, and the delta of each is the same, but they're different trades. Um, it, it, that's not going to be apples to apples. Um, but I would say, you know, at, at, at a moment in time, your your delta is telling you that these positions are going to move by the same magnitude as the stock moves, but certainly without question, if you have an outright versus a spread and they're starting out with the same delta, the gamma is not going to be the same. So as the stock does move, your outright versus your spread are going to have different gammas, no question about it. So the acceleration or move of the delta is going to be greater for your outright position, uh, even if you started out with the same delta, the gammas are not gonna be the same. I took a stab at, at maybe answering that question. Perfect. And guys, uh, that is all we have time for today. Ed, 
Thank you again for an amazing class. I definitely appreciate your time. Learned uh, a lot of new things, actually. So I appreciate it. Wonderful. Glad to be here. And i um, sure we'll see you guys again soon. Thanks for having me. Bye, Ed. Great as Bye. always. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, guys.